Now, to conclude this morning's segment, I'd like to welcome from New York City, Managing Director of Union Square Ventures, Brad Burnham. Brad, welcome to Chattanooga. So it's going to be hard to summon that kind of passion, um, but I respect it and appreciate it, and, um, and I, I think it's an incredibly important statement. Uh, so um, I'm going to, you know, I was going to talk a little bit about um, the possibilities, but I think Jonathan did a wonderful job of illustrating the possibilities of, uh, of gigabit fiber. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about who I am and what we do, and that may give you a little bit of context. Um, I actually started my career in 1979 with AT&T prior to divestiture and then lived through divestiture, so I had this kind of funny regulatory uh, uh, experience there. But I spent the last 20 years uh, investing in uh, the applications layer, mostly of the internet. And first it was AT&T Ventures and then ultimately at Union Square Ventures in New York. And I learned a couple of different things from both of those experiences. The first part of it was um, a real appreciation for the service ethic that existed at AT&T way back in the, in the 80s, 70s really. Um, and their, their real commitment to delivering a platform that people could communicate on and their, their sense of public duty around that. And I really learned to respect that level of commitment. Um, when I got involved in the venture capital business and began investing in the applications layer of the, uh, the web, I really understood the difference between that service ethic and an innovation ethic. And what happens on the internet is really phenomenal. It's driven by um, the lack of permission. Um, the, the, the internet, and you know, maybe worth stepping back and talking about it for a second, was a complete accident. If AT&T had not been deregulated, we would not have the internet. Um, the first thing was the Carter phone decision, which led to the creation of modems, which led to dial-up ISPs, which made it possible for people to access the this thing that was at the time just a university network. Um, but when they accessed it, because they accessed it through dial-up modems, because there were a bunch of tiny little businesses that had these modem banks that connected people to the internet, all of which were very competitive, um, there was no permission required to get online. And there was no permission required to put a, a website up online. And as a result, we had this enormous profusion of innovation that happened because you didn't have to ask. And so I had, in my own life, very stark examples of the difference uh, between a permissioned environment and a permissionless environment. Um, you know, we are investors at at and Ventures, Ventures in things like Twitter and Tumblr and Foursquare and Etsy and all of these businesses, if you know, if some, you had to ask somebody, even if you had to ask a boss, you know, does this make sense? The answer would be no. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit with our strategy. It potentially compromises our existing business model. You know, we don't know that there's enough customers for it. You can't prove that there are customers for it. We're not going to do it. Um, because they had to ask no permission, uh, it was able to get up there instantly. I also, early in my career, when I was at AT&T Ventures, um, experienced a little bit of what it was like to invest in a permissioned environment. Uh, I was an investor in a company called Classic Sports Network, which was um, old, old sports. Crazy idea. Uh, sports that had already been played. Uh, but it turned out to be a pretty neat uh, business, and it, and it grew very rapidly. But at the time, there were about 38 channels on most cable networks. And for classic sports to get a channel on a cable network was very, very, very difficult. Ultimately, we negotiated a deal that essentially gave up 18% of the company to John Malone in order to get onto a network. That's a permissioned environment. If each of these internet startups had to give up equity to Comcast in order to get distributed, none of them would get funded. Right, so that's the problem. So here's the concern I have. Um, we had this phenomenal um, profusion of innovation as a result of this permissionless environment. It is going away. Um, you know, we don't all appreciate why it existed. It existed because 
we started out in a dial-up environment which was competitive um, and nobody messed with the content because first of all they didn't know how to and second of all they were in a competitive environment then when we moved from dial-up to broadband, we very quickly narrowed the range of choices. You had two choices. You had uh, a DSL choice and a, uh, a cable modem choice. As, demand, as the demand for more speed uh, continued to grow, the DSL choice became less and less viable. And we really ended up with a single choice for what I might think of as advanced broadband in most markets, and that's a cable modem. Well, the cable companies came from a completely different place. You know, they came from a world where they had a great deal of control over what was actually done on their network, and they were completely vertically integrated. So all of the content was delivered, all of the user experience was controlled. Um, and when they arrived on the scene and all of a sudden became the, the largest distributor of broadband, they went to the FCC and they said, you know, we want to do more of this, but we don't want to be considered an essential service. We want to be considered an information service. Um, and so they got uh, the FCC in 2003 or two, two, I think, actually, originally, to agree that they, they could continue to deploy broadband, but they didn't have to be regulated uh, as, a te as an essential telecommunication service. And so that permissionless environment that we had for so long is beginning to be eroded. And now we're beginning to see the, the stuff that uh, Jonathan talked about, um, you know, the relationship between Comcast and Netflix. And, you know, Comcast is saying, well, gosh, you know, these guys are dumping a ton of bits on our network. And, and you know, we will you know, we'll peer with people, you know, we'll, we'll share, you know, we'll exchange data with people when that exchange is symmetrical. But these guys are just dumping all the stuff and we're not sending anything to Netflix. Well, of course you're not sending anything to Netflix because you are what is called a terminating access monopoly. You are the last mile that goes to the customers. And, and because the entire you know, history of media in this country has been broadcast, you've got a, a you know, large volume of stuff coming downstream. The only way that, that Netflix can get to a customer on a Comcast network is through Comcast. And they're beginning to say, well, gosh, that's a pretty highly leverageable position. We probably should take a piece of that transaction. Well, that is fundamentally new on the internet. You know, there has never been a notion that, um, that content providers had to pay. There was a notion that you could put your server up on the, on the net and anybody could reach it, right? And, and the only content that's being delivered to a Netflix subscriber is content that that subscriber asked for, right? And that, uh, that access provider, um, committed to provide access to the internet, but now they're trying to change the definition of the internet. So why is all that important? Well, we've been very actively involved in a conversation that you've all heard about, about network neutrality. Um, and, you know, the FCC is currently considering a set of rules um, that would de define what what defines neutrality, what, you know, that last mile, it really is, you know, think of it as not a duopoly, but think of it as an advanced, advanced broadband case, a monopoly in most places, um, and, and, and in all cases, a terminating access monopoly because all of the customers behind one network or another, and there's only one way to reach them. So that leverageable position has a certain set of responsibilities to behave in a neutral way. So that's what's being debated right now. Well, in one way, that's a real, really important discussion, and, and frankly, we believe that, that this is an essential. I've heard a lot of conversation earlier today about communications being an essential, almost human right. It's certainly an essential service, um, and we think that, you, that you know, being that provider of that communication is a, is a significant responsibility, and, and we think in order to protect innovation on the internet, it's important that, that that be treated as neutral. Well, there's a bunch of tricky problems associated with implementing that. It's, you're asking a, a federal regulatory agency to come in and decide exactly how it should be implemented. Um, if you want to be entertained, it's not all that entertaining, but go back and read some of the rulings in 96, 2000 about you know, why certain FCC regulations were made. 
and you'll realize that the FCC had no idea what was coming, right? And so the rule, the problem with regulatory solutions is that they have to be made in the context of what you know today, and you can't anticipate the future. So the better solution is to create more competition, right? Um, of course, the same people who are opposing any kind of regulation of their terminating access monopolies are also saying, well, we don't think competition is a good idea. Well, what we're talking about here today is a model that is more resilient, more flexible, more dynamic, um, and it's, it's a model that brings competition to this important last mile. Um, it, it, brings, it brings connectivity to the first place to places where there is no competition and there's nobody pulling fiber or pulling any kind of high-speed internet access. So um, I think that, that you know, we all need to be supporting this notion of opening up these markets, increasing competition, narrowing that portion of the market, that, portion, that segment of the market, which is this, by definition, kind of a natural monopoly, allowing for lots of innovation upstream in the areas of CDNs, those are content delivery networks, or, or hosting services, or backbone broadband access services, and then allowing for lots of innovation and competition on top of those services. And the, the way we can do that is by, you know, yes, we, we should move forward with uh, network neutrality rules, and at the same time, we should be very, very actively promoting competition. And I appreciate all the work that people here are doing in that way, or to that end. Thank you.